Jim Theodoras. And Jim has been one of these souls that we connected during the online technology meetings. He got connected to so many Epic members and he followed up with all of us. You are one rock star, Jim. Thank you very much, Jim Theodoras, for an AG Genuine, for being with us today. What's on your mind? Well, I first wanted to uh, comment on the previous statement, and that was, um, yes, as you get wider, it's not just reliability, but also the, I call it the hidden cost of complexity. And it's not an exponential, it's, an, it's a uh, factorial. So I currently make a lot of transceivers that have four, you know, four channels. And the, the odds that one of the four channels are marginal, and remember, this would be like in mass production at hot, at the ninth corner of you know low voltage and hot case and everything is at its extreme to get everything all the stars to align across four channels really as dramatically to um, the end cost of the module and these are hidden costs because it may not show in the bomb but those yield hits are eventually given uh, do make their way to the end customer so um, I, I cringe when I hear eight channels not because it's not doable but, um, and even not because of the component count, but just because my history of always seeing, trying to get four of something, um, for instance, in the CWM4 to, to yield out and meet customers' expectations on pricing, to try to do that with eight. Um, oh my goodness, especially when they're eight different colors. Wow, um, let alone 16. So that, it scares me a bit. <laughs> Well, let's see, if you, you ever need to, to do the testing of these devices, I can connect you with all the different companies <laughs> from, from Rod Microtech to VLC Photonics will make it happen. But indeed, if you are scared, a company J Genuine is scared to go to the 16 channel, then we all should be a bit concerned. Yes, yes. So it wasn't clear. Do you want me to uh, pop up slides now or do you yes, want me to? Yes, I want to see your up? presentation because after this, right. I expect a really, really strong discussion. You always set the bar very high for a good communication. Okay. Let me uh, pull this up. Nice cycling. I live in the Netherlands. Oh. When I see this picture, I feel <laughs> represented. Yeah, I'm showing that because I uh, my Zoom is updated and it's not showing the typical Zoom. So is that full screen for all of you? Yes, crystal clear. Okay, so just real quickly. Uh, so HG Genuine is not a common name. So just to briefly say who we are. So HG Genuine is the optical transceiver uh, part of a larger company called HD Tech. It's based in uh, Wuhan, China. And uh, the parent company is listed on the Shenzhen Stock Exchange. Uh, uh, a few years ago, they, had, uh, they pretty much dominate the pond market in China and they wanted to grow. And there's two ways of doing that. You can grow geography, and, or you can grow uh, market segments. And they uh, quite um, showed some courage and decided to try to do both simultaneously. So we moved into Datacom as well as moving outside of China simultaneously, which um, was a bit risky, but I think it's, it's paid off and we're seeing a lot of success. Um, uh, so we just opened a new $100 million factory, um, just dedicated to 400 gig um, and higher speed Ethernet is just Datacom. So um, our, uh, our current two factories are full of Pond and other things. But um, for Datacom, we have a brand new factory. Um, so this is the information we took over. It was an old building that was a uh, printing press uh, that made newspapers. And you think, well, how could you do optics there? Well, the floors could hold the weight of our machinery. And there was a lot of power available because printing presses took a lot of power. And, and it went from this dusty, old, moldy, um, a newspaper factory to now being a state-of-the-art datacom um, factory. We have uh, 14 100 meter long production lines of which, um, remember I said that the cost of complexity, um, so our more complicated parts actually have two full 100 meter lines where the optical engine consumes an entire line and then the transceiver consumes an entire line. So that's a lot of equipment um, just to, to make a transceiver. Uh, so these are some pictures from the factory. Um, these are screen grabs from the video because it's grown a lot since uh, the lockdowns. And so I've not seen it in a bit. And these uh, were some screen grabs showing that um, they're, uh, they're going full steam there. So we've actually pre-sold um, 
60% uh, of the capacity has already been pre-sold for the next three years with another 15% um, on allocation. So we're, we're sitting about 85% um, um, capacity uh, and we're still, we're still finishing out production lines. So the point I want to make, this is actually one of Jose's slides that I've, I've edited from our previous webinar, is that people think, oh, you build a transceiver and you don't just buy parts and then build a transceiver. That would make you a contract manufacturer. Um, trans, to, to get these latest, greatest uh, datacom transceivers, it's an entire ecosystem has to support that. Um, uh, so I've talked a lot last time about the optical engines. So there's a lot of various technologies that go into making an optical engine work, but there's also the cabling, like you can't do a DR4 without a Senko connector. Um, the Vixel technology needed to support not only active optical cables, but our highest volume part is an SR4, 100 gig SR4, just the sheer Vixel technology that goes into that. Um, and people often forget about the other supporting things such as market intelligence because we have to build and buy our parts way in advance of actually needing them and we can't do that with the market intelligence reports um uh, the the testing so I, I know jose you you bring up a lot about the tasting king capabilities of the eptic members um not just at the transceiver level but i'm glad the topic of wafer scale testing came up because i'm not sure how many of you know but our end customers require us to provide wafer level test data and we, we don't even make the wafers. So that means our end customer before they are hyperscales that buy our transceiver, they want to see in the cloud uploaded all the way back to if we, we buy a TOSA and then we then part of that's a laser and that comes from another vendor that came from a wafer, the, the source wafer that ends up being our product, that data must be uploaded in the, in the cloud. And there's these AI routines constantly sifting and sorting and, and giving that data and showing is the process tight? Is the process still in control? And I can't sell a transceiver without that wafer level testing, even though I don't even make wafers. So I'm glad the topic of wafer level testing came up. It's an ecosystem. And I think um, all, the, all the members of Epic need to come together and work together to, to create this ecosystem that's going to make these these 800 gig and 1.6 terabit and god forbid 3.2 uh, terabit uh, transceivers um so i just want to quickly talk about to know where you're going you have to kind of know where you've been and so this is a slide i like to show because it shows what we used to do what we do today and maybe what we're going to do tomorrow because data center isn't just one set of datacom optics there's different parts of their networks that have very different needs, which um, can get confusing sometimes. So I, I split them up into what's duplex um, and protected by like two to one, three to one, and by protection. And then what has to fan out? Because in one case, you care about uh, how much can I get on a duplex fiber and I still have to go pretty far. In the other case, you can about, I've got to touch as many ports as I can. So this is what we used to do what we do today and where we're headed tomorrow. And I don't want to spend too much time on that. What I want to do is instead jump to this because if I really put on, and this, you know, this is epic. So I've got to put on my really longer term hat and say, where's this headed so that we make the investments in technologies today. So we get to that 3.2 terabit. And that is, there's, there's this divergence in what's needed for the data center. And we saw that 10 years ago, John walked all of us through that one when the optics need diverge from telecom, also meeting datacom. You know what? Datacom needs something a little different than telecom. And today we have two different product sets. I think that's happening in data center optics as well to where everything in green here is, you know what? I need duplex connectivity. I need to go distances, um, but I still need, um, uh, you know, I still need a lot of bandwidth and speed. Um, and that's very different than below in yellow here is I need to touch as many ports as possible because I need what's called fan out. Uh, it's known as breakout in the industry, but to me, it's fan out. You're, you're, you want to touch everything. And so as we, as I put on my long term hat, and here's my dunce cap, um, I see Z, you know, coherent eventually is going to meet most of these needs, which is good for Epic members because we've seen all these phenomenal technologies that's going to play into 
400, 800 gig ZR coherent. Uh, and then also anything that must fan out wide for these AI and these uh, switch matrices. And I mean, Google now is making their, these fan outs Tories again, just like the old crazy supercomputers used to be, which I find really ironic, but it's, it's cool too. Um, that is going to be, uh, you know, maybe not CPO, maybe not COBOL, but it's going to be something very much like it. It's going to be something co-packaged, something integrated. And again, this is great news for the Epic companies because all those technologies are going to be needed to get to that level of integration. So that's why I'm glad when we're talking about the, the polymer um, modulators, uh, it was brought up dry voltage because it's not just about the switch power. It's not just about how much power the modulator needs. It's also the overall channel power. And so co-package gets rid of driving a trace on a board. Okay, I've saved some power, I removed a driver, um, but there's still drivers for the modulators. Okay, going to low drive modulators. Okay, I got rid of those drivers um, on these little chiplets on my co-package. Now I can drive straight from the Tomahawk, but there's still sureties on the Tomahawk, driving probably 75% of the power of the Tomahawk. So, oh, well, my drive voltage got even lower down to like a, you know, um, uh, you know, to, to uh, logic levels, now I can get rid of the surdies. Now being fully integrated makes a lot more sense because I'm switched straight driving into what's going to make my optical signal. And then maybe that makes sense. So, you know, long story short, this is good news for all the Epic members. I think we all need to come together and, and you know, make this a reality. And I think we have all the right talent on these calls. And thank you to Epic for, for uh, driving this and making this a reality. No, thank you to you, Jim, for giving these extraordinary presentations. Um, okay, so then I, I like it very much, the, the slide in which uh, you put our, our parts of the supply chain, at least the parts of the supply chain in which uh, you are interested no, for developing your transceivers. So let me focus on this because probably you, you are working with well, unique software, right? Uh, software yes. for designing. Okay, so we have here Aura from Synopsis. Uh, 